Good evening and welcome to the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for Monday, November 6, 2017. I'd ask everyone in attendance to rise and join us in singing O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you to the National Film Board of Canada for the uh, visuals of our country and uh, to a former member of our Grand Prairie Boys Choir and one of the members of the Men of Note uh, group in Grand Prairie for the audio. Uh, that's a fast-paced way to start off our new council term. Uh, welcome to uh, council meetings for our first business meeting of this new council term. Um, looking forward to getting going and uh, let's start with uh, the adoption of the previous council meeting minutes, item 3.1. Can I have a motion to adopt that set of minutes? Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given, I would move that uh, Council uh, approve the minutes of the City Council meeting held Monday, September 18th, 2017. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Were there any errors or omissions that uh, we needed to amend before we adopted that set of minutes? Seeing nobody ringing in, then I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, that'll take us to item 3.2, the minutes of the special city council meeting. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. I had moved that we make a motion to adopt the, or sorry, to approve the special minute council meeting from Monday, September 25th, okay. 2017. Thanks very much, Councillor Plot. Any errors or omissions in that set of minutes? Again, seeing nobody ringing in, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. And then finally, this is one that everybody was actually in attendance for, item 3.3, .3, the organizational meeting uh, of this council term from Monday, October 23rd. Councillor Bressy. Thank you, Mayor Given. I would move that we adopt the minutes of the council organization meet organizational meeting held Monday, October 23rd. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. Any errors or omissions in that set of minutes? Does it look like everybody got appointed to the committees that they were supposed to? what we all remember anyways, hey? okay? Uh, seeing nobody ringing in, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Uh, and finally, that will bring us to a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Could I have a motion for item number four to adopt the agenda as presented? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Given. I would move that council adopt the agenda as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, any changes or additions to the agenda? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this takes us to the delegation portion of our agenda. This is an opportunity that we have at every regular uh, meeting of City Council for any member of the community to come forward and make a presentation at Council on any community-related matter. Uh, we do always appreciate it when people call ahead of time and let us know that they're coming, and we do have a, a couple of those delegations tonight, uh, but the opportunity does exist if somebody wanted to come forward uh, from the floor as well. So we will uh, start with our delegations in order that they're listed on our agenda, and the first is a uh, uh, delegation from the Shores uh, and Miss Margaret Gagnon. Ms. Gagnon, if you'd like to come forward. Uh, Sure, absolutely. So just come forward to the presenter's table, uh, take a seat, make yourself comfortable. Um, and if you'd just please introduce yourselves um, for a recording secretary and make yourself welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor uh, Bill Given, Councillors and City staff. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Margaret Gagnon and this is my colleague, uh, Louise Slump. Councillor Gagnon. 
Uh, Ms. Gagnon, just while you're there, if, if you could uh, please make yourself comfortable and have a seat and the uh, microphone will pick you up actually much better uh, for the, uh, the recording. Okay. Uh, our third committee member, uh, Darlene Arndt, wasn't able to be with us today. However, today we make up a group of concerned citizens from the Shores, a gated community at 8910 122nd Avenue. We represent all 52 unit owners of the complex, some of whom are in the gallery tonight. Uh, our uh, condo treasurer here is here as well, Dave Trudell, and if you have any questions regarding finances, he'll be more than happy to answer those as well. In the spring of this year, many of our residents became very concerned with what they saw that, that they deemed to be another huge increases in their property taxes. Most unit holders saw an average increase of $300, and many felt that this combined with the in increases over the past two years would soon put them in a financial situation where these taxes were no longer affordable. We formed a committee over the summer, drafted a petition for the city, and Louise collected the signatures over the summer. The petition asked for a review of our mill rate, given that we felt was an unfair taxation. At the end of August, we submitted a petition to the mayor, council, city manager, and the manager of the tax department. I think maybe our timing was a little bit wrong because the civic election was announced and we didn't seem to receive a reply until late in September. Uh, and we thought at that time that probably the current council was setting it aside for the new council to deal with. Uh, later, in the later part of September, I received a phone call from Acting Director of Corporate Services, Susan Walker. She informed me that a previous council had held a meeting back in February of 28th of 2017, whereby the, it was decided not to create a separate category for condominiums. When I asked what that meant, it was indicated to me that our petition was pretty much dead in the water and that the previous council had felt that everyone in the city had the, the same access to services regardless of where they lived. Everyone had equal access to museums, libraries, Center 2000, and it was up to the individual to decide whether they would utilize any one given service. While this is true, we do not feel that our, it addressed our request, as we were speaking of a completely different kind of service. Uh, when I asked if there would be an opportunity to at least dump our snow on, in the wintertime on city property, she indicated to me, no, and justified it by saying then all the retail, retail community would have to be allowed to dump their snow on city property. We are a not-for-profit group. We are 52 homeowners who happen to live in a gated community. We are the only gated community in the city of Grand Prairie, and yet we are lumped in with other groups like apartment condominiums, retail services, and for-profit groups. Our committee is talking about road maintenance, snow removal, water catchments, street lights, street cleaning. These services are delivered to every individual homeowner's end of the driveway within the residential area. At the shores, um, we are treated as one single family dwelling and any services that are provided us to us stop at our gate. However, our units are taxed as if these services were provided to the end of our driveway. The city does not do any snow removal or road maintenance for the complex. Street cleaning, road repairs are the responsibility of the association as are repairs required to underwater catchments and sewer lines. Street light maintenance and electrical usage are also the responsibility of the association. And we contract our own garbage disposal. We do, however, receive RCMP support, emergency medical support, and fire protection in our complex. All these items are expensive. When our water catchment basement froze and cracked, the board spent upward to $25,000 to replace and repair the damage. Snow removal and hauling, hauling average $20,000 a year unless there's a, uh, not very much snowfall. 
street light maintenance, electrical and garbage collection add another $6,000 to these costs. Approximately three years ago, our roadways and gutters began to shine so, so, show, sign, show signs of wear and needed to be replaced at the cost of upward $150,000. When, the city catchment, when a city catchment freezes in the city streets in a residential area of the city, the City of Grand Prairie Public Works Department sends a steam truck to defrost the catchments so they will not break. Snow removal, street cleaning, street repair are all provided to the end of the driveway for residential homeowners. Street lines are maintained, repaired, and replaced by the city annually even if the lamp standard is sitting at the end of an individual property homeowner. Sidewalks and roadways are routinely repaired, replaced, and maintained to the end of the drive, driveway for residential owners. Yet our services stop at the gate and we are taxed as if they are applied by the city to each individual driveway. Recently, the argument was provided that if residents can no longer afford to live at the shores, they should not live there. Although our bylaws state that we are an 18 plus community, 95% of our residents are retired or semi-retired. Of these, at least 16 unit, owner, unit holders live alone and are widowed. Living in a gated community gives them a feeling of security. To look at these folks as wealthy is a mistake. They are simply people who worked hard, saved their money, and wanted a place to live in their old age where the grass was cut and the snow was shoveled. While it's not the purpose today of my visit to lecture council or mayor, I would like to ask when is enough enough? Taxes for all city residents are going up. And perhaps we should be more focusing more on the needs of the city rather than the wants. We all know what the difference between a need and a want is and a nice to have. I enjoy the East Link Center, Revolution Place, the public library, many parks and walking trails. I would not dispose that these are wonderful wants the city has provided. However, since my husband and I moved to the shores only two short years ago, our property taxes have risen $806, just in two years. At this rate, it's not sustainable. Like, you keep hitting me with four and $500 increases every year. I'm going to have to find another place to live. They're not sustainable for myself and not for many other residents at the shores. We have included a few impact statements for you that, that I will give you uh, together with a package that I would like you to have a look at and read so that you understand who we are and what we feel. We're not asking the city to begin providing some of these services at the shores. We're willing to take care of our complex. However, we are asking that recognition in the form of a slight reduction in residential taxes be considered to compensate unit holders for the services not provided to the end of the driveway for our residents, rather than just to the end to our gate. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And if there's any questions or concerns, uh, you can try to answer them. <laughs> sure, well, absolutely, <laughs> really we do, sure. we, we do always appreciate that opportunity and uh, sort of a, a portion of our delegation process. Uh, I always get the opportunity to ask if there are any questions for the delegation uh, from members of the council. Any questions for the delegation at this point? Okay, it looks like... I did bring the original petition, and I did bring a folder for each uh, council member, uh, and the impact statements are in the folder, and if you would like to read them, that would be very much appreciated. Sure. <laughs> you could actually just give them to Councillor Bressy, and he can hand them, we can hand them around. We're a bit of a team here.
So I don't see anybody ringing in with any questions from Council. And so, ladies, just in terms of the uh, process that our Council agenda follows, we deal with our delegation business uh, actually towards the end. Uh, it's very near to the, well, I suppose sort of second last piece of business the Council deals with. So you're more than welcome uh, to either stick around tonight uh, and uh, watch as it comes to that. The most likely outcome is that it would be referred to a standing committee of Council to review the information and potentially the previous administration report. Um, but that action will happen towards the end of the council meeting. So you could either follow up with council after the fact or with administration after the fact. Okay. Sure. And, and I'm sure that there's some contact information in here, and I'm certain we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would also acknowledge that there are a number of uh, other residents of the Shores. There's some that I know that they're residents of the Shores and some that I'm assuming are residents of the Shores. Uh, and so uh, can Council uh, imagine that the presentation uh, speaks on behalf of all the residents that are here this evening? Okay. Well, we can save you all the trouble of coming up and making your own independent presentations. Uh, but we certainly want to acknowledge that there's more than just the two ladies uh, that presented on camera that were here tonight. Uh, we do have another uh, gentleman from the Shores, uh, Mr. Trottle. Do you want to come forward? With some additional information? Uh, yeah. So if you'll just introduce yourself, Dave. Hello. Yes, my name is Dave Trottle, and uh, I uh, live at the Shores as well. Uh, we had some discussion with a committee for uh, last year, uh, and it actually uh, didn't go uh, kind of the way we wanted. We weren't as prepared as we should have been. And uh, unfortunately, it was one of those things that we were expecting someone else's going to be speaking, and then all of a sudden, at the last minute, I did it. And uh, it didn't, uh, I didn't feel really, uh, really good about that. So what the, the key point that I just wanted to make, and there's just two, one is, uh, I, I got some information from my own tax information. I got no name on it or anything, so it's not like it's, you know, confidential or anything. But it's essentially from when we moved to the shores, we bought a new new house there in 2007. They built it. We moved in in October. And so our first tax year was 2008. So from 2008 to 2017, our taxes have gone up 67%. Okay? And our assessment along on those same tax notices the increase from in those same 10 years was 14.4%. So taxes, of course, have uh, kind of outpaced them dramatically. But it's not just the taxes have gone up because we realize they have to go up to pay for services and so on. So it's, it's not that. It's that we are, as a community, though, the extra costs that we incur based on what Margaret was telling you about the garbage pickup, street lights, snow removal, and road and curb work that we've done over the last 10 years amounts to just over $300,000 that we pay out of our pockets. So we're paying for all those things on top of paying the increased taxes, which our neighbors outside our gates do not pay. And so that's what's frustrating about it is at one time we had heard, and it's from a former city manager, uh, Dave Gourley, I believe his name is, had stated that at one time the, that the city had a a uh, reduced mill rate for uh, condo uh, associations or at least bare land condos. And that made a big difference to them. It was uh, it re because of these extra costs that we're, we don't have the choice of taking a part in this. We have the choice of being a part of the library or whatever, certainly we do that, but not on these. And so I guess that's the key point I wanted to make. It's just, it's not only the increased taxes, but the, uh, the costs that we incur to get those same services that we're paying extra for. And uh, Mr. Treadle's uh, referencing a spreadsheet that he's got there. He passed on a copy to the, the city clerk who will make a copy and circulate it to council as well. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Absolutely. Okay, any Is questions there, for the delegation? Again, Thank seeing you. none. Thanks very much, Mr. Yep, Treadle. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so was there anybody else that wished to come forward with new information on this topic? With any new information? So thank you very much, and again, appreciate the fact that there's more than uh, more than just the presenters that we've heard. There's actually a, a fairly full audience. I thought it was just because you're all so excited to see our new city council. You wanted to come and see one of the first meetings. But fair enough. Uh, so we'll move on to our uh, next delegation that had let us know in advance. Uh, I see Mr. Dan Gorman uh, from Evergreen Park is here. Mr. Gorman, I think you have some other colleagues with you. Absolutely. So 
So you've all seen the process. If you'll just introduce all the members of your delegation and, and uh, make yourself welcome. My name is Shelley Lazenby. My name is Rob Clayton. I'm the president of Evergreen Park or the Grand Prairie Regional Ag Society. Who's the technology guy that you got with you there? Dan Norman, our general manager. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if this thing is going to come on somewhere in a minute. Oh, look at that. There we go. Thank you uh, very much for seeing us. And uh, I guess first I'd like to uh, welcome all the new councillors uh, to council and, and welcome their returning ones back. So. Uh, yeah, great to see you all tonight, and thank you for seeing us. Uh, Rob Clayton is our board president, and uh, Shelley Lazenby is also one of our board members and is the vice chair of our uh, finance committee as well out at Evergreen Park. And as we do or try to do now every uh, November, we like to give you a quick synopsis of what's happened out at the park over the last year and and uh, gently ask uh, you for, for uh, perhaps some funding at the end of that. Uh, so I will start off and... Uh, and just talk a little bit about uh, 2017 uh, Evergreen Park. And I do apologize mm -hmm. in advance for those of you that have heard this before. We, we just have to assume that some, uh, some of you may have not. So uh, we're a 1,000-acre multi-purpose facility that's uh, committed to being the most successful regional agricultural exhibition and recreation destination in northern Alberta. Uh, just a quick picture of our, our place. Most people don't realize that we have over 29 buildings, uh, 30 buildings it is now, and... Uh, it's like a little mini city out there. There's just so many activities. Uh, it's, I promised a few of you to, to take you on a Gilligan's Island three-hour tour one of these days, and, and we will do that in the spring. Um, we have our roots and base in Grand Prairie. It started in 1910, and continuing to this day, so much of what happens at Evergreen Park involves Grand Prairie and the surrounding area. So our attendance last year, just over half a million. And uh, we've estimated November and December, uh, obviously, but that, you know, using similar numbers to the last couple of years, uh, basically over a half million people uh, uh, come out to Evergreen Park in, in various, uh, to various events uh, uh, each year. So with a breakdown of that, we, we uh, 217 were at the Antrex Center. Clarkson Hall was one of the exciting ones for us because up until this, this last year, we had one event a year at Clarkson Hall. We would... We had the farm family banquet. We would, we would cook the food at the Entrex Center. We'd bring it in the back door of the Clarkson Hall, and we'd bring it out as if we had cooked it there through the kitchen because uh, the kitchen was in really, really sad shape. Most of you know what the inside looked like. We've had uh, 39 events this year. We expect to have over 50 next year, and uh, you know a lot of them are internal ones, but uh, we've had everything from weddings to celebrations of life, and uh, it's just been a, a real good return for us. And, uh, you know, it, this 601 events internally ourselves, but with the campground, the, the 8,000 people there, we don't even include the minor baseball tournaments, uh, Game Country Archers, the Evergreen Learning and Innovation Center. Uh, with everything added in together, there's over 1,200 uh, events each year at Evergreen Park. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Rob. So we do many fundraising events at the park. Um, many of you have probably seen some of them, but we'll just uh, go through a few of them here. Uh, the Hanger Dance for Stars, uh, Tennille's Big Hearts for Big Kids, and Tennille has raised, I think, in the neighborhood of $1.2 million uh, over the last few years uh, with her event at the park. Uh, GPRC President's Ball, which has been at the park for a number of years, uh, Festival of Trees, which is coming up next week, uh, and is a is a full week-long event and and um, has been at the park for a number of years <clears throat> and is a big fundraiser for the hospital, as most of you know. <clears throat> uh, Festival of Trees Gala last year was a huge success. Uh, the Northern Light Show, which uh, is part of the Peace Draft Horse Club, um, also raises money uh, and donates money to various um, groups around Grand Prairie and region. Uh, the Mr. Marks, Mr. Mike's Paint the Park Purple, uh, raising money for uh, cancer research, which is uh, part of our horse racing. <clears throat> so 
So annually we raise, uh, our, the events at our park raise about a, a million and a half dollars for local charities. Uh, a number of other annual events at the park, the, the wedding show, uh, McGovern's show and sale in, uh, in February, uh, Growing the North Conference, which brings in a lot of people from all over the province and, and I would say even Western Canada. Uh, the Peace Country Agri Show, which has uh, both ag, ag, ag events uh, in the Drysdale Centre as, well as, um, as well as a trade show portion of it. Uh, Peace Wapiti Academy grad, uh, 4-H club, uh, Good Friday services are held at uh, Entrex Centre. Uh, Peace Region Petroleum Show uh, comes again in 2019, so it's uh, every second year. Uh, <clears throat> Hunt Mania Show in the fall, Sports Expo, Home and Garden Show and the Fall Home and Leisure Show, and the North, Pe North Peace Bracket Racing Association Spring Spectacular. <clears throat> Dan? So we have lots of organizations and user groups, and they have lots of events out at Evergreen Park. Uh, of course, most people are going to be familiar with the Farmer's Market Christmas, Christmas Craft Show and Sale uh, every year. There's uh, barrel racing, the Jim Canna Club uh, has lots of events out there. And for the last three years, we've had the uh, Blatchford Field of Nightmares, so that's been a great a great addition to Evergreen Park and lots of fun. The Prairie Dusters Drill Team. Um, this is what we call ELLIS, the Evergreen Center for Resource Excellence and Innovation. And we have busloads of city and county students from grade two and up come through and tour this, uh, this center that's out on, at Evergreen Park. There's uh, research uh, and innovation being done out there and even some of the research ideas that have been developed out there are being used around the country and even in other countries as well. Uh, they are looking to expand their footprint out at Evergreen Park and if anyone's interested in a tour we'd be happy to uh, do that for you because it's really very interesting. In the spring. In the spring. <laughs> We've got lots of arena uh, events uh, roping, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got MMA. We, this is a picture of our first outdoor <laughs> MMA event. Uh, South Peace Horse Club is one of our user groups. They've held some events, the Horse Club Championships, Nighthawks Ski and Board Swap, that was just on Saturday. And of course, Stompede. Everybody's familiar with Stompede. Uh, this is one of our biggest events and our biggest user groups. They bring in so many people from around the Peace Country and, and even around uh, the province and BC. I've heard upwards of 50,000 people attend Stompede. Uh, I would like to say thank you to uh, the City of Grand Prairie for supporting Stompede financially this year uh, because they're one of our biggest user groups so that was really great to see them uh, have some success this year. We have the horses at Evergreen Park so this is the fun stuff that we get to do in July and August uh, weekends in uh, at Evergreen Park. We have lots of families coming out and attending the races and that's really great to see that that's another family friendly event that goes on at Evergreen Park that our citizens get to get to attend uh, including the Alberta Derby so this will be this was the third year that we hosted the Alberta Derby and it's important to note that local business people uh, put up the $50,000 purse that can be won at the Alberta Derby so that we can host it and we've had lots of accolades for hosting it here in Grand Prairie. The monster trucks, we've held that, I'm sure everybody's seen the, the ads for that, 6,000 people coming to, to watch that. And the Northern Spirit Light Show, over 40,000 people attended last year. Um, and there's a charity component to that as well. 
we have uh, Troyer Town. So Troyer Town is another family-friendly event, or uh, not so much. Well, it's a winter-long event. Uh, people can come out, bring their families. It's something fun and safe to do in the winter. And we put in ice out at Evergreen Park. So uh, skating rink for all of the, the Grand Prairie and area citizens to use. And we have a section uh, partitioned off so that uh, young children can be safe while they uh, have some fun and activity skating as well. Uh, always nice to have the, the heated change rooms and washrooms for that. And of course, the Northern Alberta Trail Series. So we were uh, one of a two-part series of trail run at Evergreen Park. I, I myself ran in it, and I heard nothing but fabulous feedback about it, uh, especially the, the uh, run for children that was to raise money for a charity, which this year we raised money for the Reading U University in Grand Prairie. So that was a huge success as well. Pass it over to Dan now. Thanks, Shelley. I think we're all aware that uh, Evergreen has been designated uh, an EVAC center for the region, and uh, you know we've been requested to feed, house, and support up to 3,500 people, their pets, and other animals in an emergency. And obviously, that, that requires constant power. So we now have the backup generators on site. We test them all the time, and we're, we're you know we're very pleased about that. Uh, we were actually asked this last summer to be uh, ready and available to accept displaced uh, people from the forest fires uh, if required from. Uh, other parts of Alberta and even BC at one point, and, and thankfully we didn't have to do that, but we were prepared to do that. A couple of the newer capital projects for 2017. Again, we've talked about Clarkson Hall, uh, just a, a great year there. We also opened up a new family restaurant underneath uh, in the grandstand uh, at the end of May, uh, just so that when people came out for events, they, they, they wouldn't have to only have uh, food from the food trucks. Uh, they had healthier alternatives, and they were. this has been serviced out of our on-site restaurant that you know, services, the casino side, but obviously the, the young people couldn't go in there, so that's been very, very successful. And a few new user groups who have applied uh, uh, or have started uh, their photo club, Disc Golf, it's either 19 or 27 holes that's out there. Councillor Bressy might have a better idea. But we're, it started out there and it's a temporary course. Uh, a couple of the weddings that went on this summer, people actually went out and did the disc golf before they had the weddings at, at uh, Clarkson, so that was cool. Uh, the Indigenous culture events, we've been working with them for a couple of years. We've got a, a one, one thing we've got is land out there, so we've got areas that, that, that we're negotiating with them on a more permanent basis to have them do certain things. And our community support supper, this, this year will be the third year that we've done our community support supper, and we basically, um, we served last year over 1,000. The first year it was 750. We're, we're expecting between 12 and 1,500 this year. Uh, we bus uh, people in, mostly it's from the Grand Prairie area. There's 12 buses donated by both the public school and the Catholic school systems and drivers, and we pick them up all over town. We bring them out. We feed them five-course meal. Uh, we have bouncy castles for the kids. We give them rides uh, uh, through the light show on, on the, with the horses, and, and most of them have not had that experience at all. Um, and everything is donated. All the food is donated, everything, you know, all the, the manpower, uh, the buses, the drivers, everything is donated, but we just don't advertise it. So, you know, we've talked to the to the paper and the radio stations. We don't, we don't. There's no no radio on site. There's no don't, donator boards or anything like that. It's just about serving the people, and uh, you know, we're letting you know about it. Quite frankly, just because um, it it is uh, it is a wonderful gift to the community, and uh, you know, we've got a pretty unique area where we can set up and feed a thousand people, and it's not difficult to do. So. And we just, I just started it one year and just on a, you know, because we had an open weekend and it's just kind of gone, it's taken off. So we're very excited about that. It's our most fun event of the year and all of our staff, we, we tell them we can't pay you, but you don't have to work and we, we couldn't pry them away with a crowbar. It's a, it's a pretty special weekend. So this is just a picture of our team. I'm not going to name names or anything, but we're very proud of our team. Everyone is pushing the same way and a lot of you know a lot of our people out there are, are motto when you walk into our admin office is guests first and we, we really try and live that every day, every single day and uh, we also have a, an amazing board, I say that when I'm not surrounded by board members uh, as well, uh, but we do have a very strong board, most of you know that and uh, we're very, very fortunate that way. 
So I'm just going to mention one quick thing. We just have a, a few more things to talk about. The economic impact, I think we're all aware that that uh, Evergreen Park and as many activities obviously add millions of dollars to Grand Prairie and the, and the economy, but, but we did commission an economic impact study about a year and a half ago and uh, it actually came out uh, three weeks after our last presentation to City, so this is the first time that you've heard it. Uh, but I'm just going to turn it over to Shelley to, to, to share a few numbers and it's kind of interesting information. With all of that events that you saw up there, we began to wonder, well, what type of an impact does it have to our, our region and our community? So as Dan said, with over 1,200 events, and that doesn't count a lot of those uh, things that we can't necessarily do a, a head count for, uh, we were wondering about this, and it far exceeded our expectations for sure. Um, so what you're looking at up there right now is uh, the actual spend of, of people who come through or come to Evergreen Park for all of these events, including what Evergreen Park spends in the community as well. So uh, if you notice the visitor spending and local attendee spending is uh, over $12,000, or mm -hmm. 12 million, $12 million, <laughs> sorry. Um, and for an almost $19 million uh, initial spending impact, uh, those visitors and attendees are spending money in a variety of different uh, areas. Most of that would be spent right in the Grand Prairie area, and you can see the number up there, the 12 million, 300,000. Uh, lots of restaurants, accommodations, uh, gas stations, all of that kind of thing. And this number is kind of the ripple effect of those other numbers. So in addition to the direct spending that happens on all of those things, that then means that there are jobs created and things bought and, uh, and all of the other economic impacts, the gross domestic product of our province and our region. Uh, so the annual impact of that is over $43 million that you know, those, those events at Evergreen Park help to promote. Just as an aside as well, it was Richard Hudson that did the economic impact study, not just for ourselves, but for all seven uh, regional um, agricultural societies in Alberta. Uh, and he's a very, you know, a, a recognized, um, I won't say expert, but specialist in that field. So we, uh, we thank you again for your considered support and would like to ask you for some potential financial support moving forward. Uh, we're also offering a significant marketing profile at Evergreen Park as part of this ask. Uh, we would like to ask the, uh, the city to consider um, a transit relationship of some kind. We don't have specifics with it, but, uh, and I, you know, we've started this dialogue, so, so you know, I, I think a few of you have actually had this conversation with a few of us already. and. Uh, we're wondering about the possibility of getting some type of a relationship so that we could have transit service out attending the larger events at Evergreen Park, um, you know, to and from the, city to, you know, from the city to the park and back. And that's about as far as we've got. We don't have specifics. We realize everything comes with a cost, but we, we just like to get that out there because we get asked all the time and we're commissioning a small shuttle bus which should be working and... Uh, and uh, out there in, uh, by the end of December, by the end of this year. We've actually got the bus now, we're just kind of refurbishing it because we could only afford a fairly, fairly weak or poor uh, quality bus, but there will be one on the road with our name on it. So um, We are requesting financial support from the City of Grand Prairie in the amount of $200,000 a year for the next five years and uh, uh, to, to go towards operational support. No matter how much we grow, a build, or not buildings, but uh, organizations like, like ours are ones that are just going to always require uh, financial support to, to sustain. And uh, we're, we're just asking you if, if, if in your wisdom you can find some money laying around that you would just love to, to put a certain way, we would, we would not re refuse that, that offer. Uh, marketing profile at the park, um, you know, just fairly standard stuff, but we do, we do have some uh, pretty 
uh, you know, great uh, potential for signage, marking our many TVs, uh, no charge booth each year at the Agri Show, and just a number of other where, you know, links to our website and all of that stuff um, that we would offer on that as well. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, uh, for sure, we wanted to come and let you know what we're doing. We're very excited about the growth. Uh, we had a challenging year in 2016, as did half the world, but uh, rebounded very strongly. I will say this, uh, Bridget Henniger gives her regrets. She had another commitment tonight. She is the head of our finance committee and uh, wanted me to mention to you that our latest financial statement is only till the end of September, but as of the end of September, we are over budget in our revenues and we are under budget in our expenses and we're very happy with that. So, so thank you and open the floor to questions. Thanks very much for your presentation. Are there any questions for the delegation? Questions for the delegation tonight? Councillor Plot. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, great presentation. I, I appreciate that. It's a lot of, lot of learning. I'm, I didn't know as much about the facility, so thanks. I'm just wondering if we're going to have an opportunity to have that presentation for us to have for future use. I'm not sure if that's something that will be available to us. Yes, I actually sent it to you earlier today. I tried to make it really early, but we missed. Uh, so you, you have it as of late this afternoon. Okay, great. Yeah. Try to scribble notes, and I'm watching we're all scribbling, so I'm not getting them all down. So, um, and then my, my other question is, what are we currently funding to Evergreen Park now? Is there any funding currently offered by the city, currently, other than the Stompede? Uh, directly to Evergreen Park, currently not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bressy. We have we historically contributed anything financially to Evergreen Park? No, not. We made an ask, I think, about a year ago. Uh, Mayor Given, and uh, that was the first time I think in in, in a while. And thanks very much. It's pretty direct answer, direct question, direct answer. Yep. Perfect. Uh, any other any other questions for the delegation, Councillor Thiessen? Very much, Mayor Given. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, well, it was better than last year's. That's for sure. Is uh, really really good and very very thorough. My question actually is in regards to your transit to the park. So you said that you have uh, a bus kind of lined up, ready to go, maybe seek out future options with the city of Grand Prairie. Uh, what are you anticipating the costs uh, on operating that bus for yourself are currently? It is a, a great question that's been asked me already. My, we've kind of uh, struck a little subcommittee to work on that. Um, we literally just bought this bus about a month ago. It came up on Kijiji and uh, uh, Simon Jukes, I don't know if anyone remembers him from old days of Grand Prairie, owned the bus company up in high level and uh, let us have it for basically hauling it down here pretty well. So and it's in, in reasonable shape. So we're, we're just at the beginning process of that too. So I just, I, that's as much as I can tell you. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, maybe, maybe you might be able to answer maybe a, a higher vision sort of uh, question in that regards. Uh, how, how often would you uh, prefer to have the frequency of that bus run from city to Evergreen Park. Are you talking the transit bus well, or, or our shuttle bus? Your shuttle bus or even, uh, we, we can expand that, even if the city were to be so inclined to uh, uh, help out with the services like that in the future, like how, how we frequent were, We were like? thinking of, I don't know, six to eight major events, maybe six to ten major events with the uh, with the transit bus, uh, the, the bigger events during the year. It wouldn't be worthwhile to either of us if it was in the smaller ones, so we were... You know, discussing at uh, at one of our, our subcommittee meetings before it being things like, you know, the stompedes, uh, the grow the north, uh, the the bigger events like that. As far as our shuttle bus is concerned, um, we we're looking at uh, even the idea of uh, you know some of the seniors would like to come out on a more regular basis when we're having little guest get-togethers and stuff. So, uh, some of the hotels have indicated the same, and so we're. We feel that we're, it's going to be a growth and learning thing with that. That's about as much as we've, we've had. We've had people that have suggested that they might want to rent it if we're going to have an event at Clarkson Hall so that they've got you know, a designated driver type of a... Anyway, there's a whole bunch of uh, opportunities with that. that we're, okay, thank you very much. Okay, I see Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm just curious about the operational request. With the growing revenue of the park, do you anticipate that there's going to be a time when the, uh, when the revenue comes down? Uh, or, sorry, when the operational gap or the, the demand for, 
funding for operational support comes down. Um, and also, who else do you ask for, or have you asked historically for support for operational needs? Uh, th thank you, Councillor Friesen. Um, first, uh, on the first question, uh, within five years, yes. Um, five years ago, our long-term debt was approximately $8 million. It's now almost half that. So it, we reduced it by that much. Within the next five years, we hope to be, we plan to be, or, you know, Hopefully it's under $2 million for sure, but, but my goal is a little bit less than that. So within five years, significant difference on that end. Um, uh, we currently get some strong operational funding from the County of Grand Prairie. Uh, we get some operational help from the MD of Greenview and uh, have from them for the last five years. Um, and other than that, we, you know, we apply for a lot of grants, uh, but they're, they're non-operational grants and uh, yeah. That's one of the reasons that 2016 was a challenging year for us is that we applied for and got all three grants. So we had to come up with lots of matching money to make it all work. And we're glad that we did. One of them was Clarkson Hall, but that's the majority of our operational. Great. Thank, you. Areas, so. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Council Friesen. I don't see anybody else in the queue. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody, for your presentation this evening. Uh, you saw the um, um, process or outline that I gave the last group. We deal with our delegation business at the end of the agenda. Uh, it's most likely, given that this would have a budget implication, that this would either be referred to budget or a standing committee for review. Right. So just for context, um, so you can make, based on that, you can make a choice about whether you stick around tonight and watch the rest of the meeting or not. Thank you very much for your time tonight, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, everybody. Okay, and we had one uh, last delegation let us know ahead of time uh, that they were going to present. Uh, we have Mr. McLean from Tidewater Midstream and Infrastructure Limited. Um, and I have a feeling you have a team. At least I see a, a group back there. But come on up, Mr. McLean. There's, th your entourage, you just travel with that many people, hey? <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome, uh, so gentlemen, if you'll just uh, introduce yourselves uh, once you're all set there and... Um, and welcome. So my name's Scott Acock. I'm uh, Director of Storage Operations at Tidewater. Thanks, Scott. And Scott. My name is Scott McLean. I'm a Manager of uh, Environment, Health and Safety and Regulatory Compliance with Tidewater. Good evening, uh, Mayor Given, uh, city councillors, and city staff. This project was first initiated and uh, spoken to at uh, city level a number of times, uh, even dating back uh, quite some years ago, I guess. Uh, and Scott was involved with that uh, from back then. So, um, <clears throat> so tonight we're here uh, as Tidewater Midstream to provide um, mayor and council with an update on our project and uh, give a bit of an overview for uh, the new council members that may not be aware of what the project entails. So first I'd like to start off by uh, who is Tidewater Midstream and Infrastructure? Uh, because we are a relatively new organization. We are incorporated in 2015. We're publicly traded on the TSX Venture Exchange. Um, the one piece that I don't have up there, uh, we're approximately a half a billion dollar company at the moment. Uh, we're going to have, uh, through a recent acquisition, roughly 300 people working for us. We're a Calgary-based organization with operations um, throughout uh, the province of Alberta. Uh, we have an experienced and dedicated executive and management team. Tidewater owns and operates uh, 35 uh, gas processing facilities around the province. Uh, these facilities are comprised of both uh, sweet and uh, sour uh, product. We own, operate, and maintain thousands of kilometers worth of pipeline. And uh, probably the most important piece uh, to myself is that we are a top tier regulatory and a safety performer compared to our tiers, our peer story. Uh, we are a reliable, trustworthy partner uh, in the communities in which we operate. So also very important to us. So if I may jump into the project overview, so the project um, is a $200 million project. Uh, the facility uh, is comprised of sweet gas compression, uh, DHI units, and 
This facility is located within the proposed Hughes Lake uh, area structure. Uh, another component of the project is our sweet gas storage reservoir. And this is the use of a depleted natural gas uh, reservoir that was on production, um, and Scott has the details on that, I think since early 80s? Early 90s, yeah. 90s? Yeah. So that, that reservoir has been depleted uh, from sweet, sweet natural gas. And um, we'll get into the, the bits of that in a little bit as far as how we're going to uh, utilize that depleted reservoir. There's also a sweet gas pipeline, 30 inch, uh, 22 kilometers in length that heads uh, west of the city. Um, and the natural gas storage. So I'd like to just chat about a little bit about that because it seems like there's a lot of questions around natural gas storage. Um, so natural gas storage is uh, based on the supply and demand across North America. Um, the way I like to discuss it, and Scott will go into probably a little bit better detail, uh, just because I'm a simple fella. Uh, think RV storage, uh, storage yards. What we have is a, an empty uh, gas reservoir, and um, in non-high usage times, we'll be uh, putting natural gas, sweet natural gas, into that reservoir, much like an RV. You're not using your RV, where do you park it? You park it in a, an RV storage yard for a fee, right? So it's the same principle for us with our natural gas storage is um, when there's no, not a large demand for gas, we will take it in off the system and um, find a home for it uh, temporarily until demand rises again and then it gets uh, put back out into the transition systems, transmission systems. Uh, no, that's pretty good. I, I, uh, I, I think a good analogy is also grain storage. It's just different fundamentals there. Grain production is very variable. Supply is very constant, so you need storage to uh, meet that imbalance. Natural gas would be very similar. So again, I guess one piece that I want to just bring back, uh, you know, to maybe elaborate a little bit more on is the facility component. That is the, the piece that is most... Uh, I guess um, it's right inside the city limits there uh, in the newly annexed uh, portion to the west, just on the west side of the airport there. Uh, Tidewater Midstream currently owns 80 acres, an 80 acre parcel out there, and that is the proposed location of our um, um, facility. So here, uh, where the star is, is where we are in relation uh, with the Hughes Lake um, area structure plan. And you can see the new uh, ring road bypass, et cetera, that is, uh, that's also there. So we're just on the east side of that. This, uh, this map, hopefully you folks can see it, uh, fairly decent. Um, this, this is really the, the whole uh, project um, obviously where you folks are most concerned and are, want to be most aware of is uh, the components within the city limits. So the 8 to 25 uh, compressor site is our new uh, facility that we're proposing to build and um, we've gone through the application process with the Provincial Regulatory um, Authority, the AER. So there's uh, the main components of our facility are, or the project, sorry, are the facility at 8 to 25. Uh, that's our legal land description uh, for that. And then there's the 30 inch pipeline, which is the green line that you can see uh, stretching out to the west, which uh, connects us up to our uh, alliance uh, connection there, which gives us a connection point um, basically to draw from and to sell to um, as, as, as demand uh, dictates. The, the line going going north will then connect to, to Nova. So we'll, it's a unique facility in Alberta. We'll be the only facility connected to both Alliance and, and Nova. Yeah, so we don't want to draw too much attention away from uh, the, the components that are outside the city limits um, because I, I understand you guys are most uh, concerned probably or have uh, most uh, thoughts around what's inside your city limits. But the... Just to give you folks a full picture of what we're actually working towards, and um, yeah, so the, the the heart of the the project is the facility, 
uh, at 8 to 25. So here's uh, two artist renderings of what our facility um, will look like. Uh, the, the top one that's kind of in behind, I have another snapshot of that one that'll come up on the next slide. Um, and then the bottom one is when, when we add trees to it, and that is our plan to have trees uh, on the easterly edge of this, uh, of this facility. So one, one really important piece that I'd like you folks to, to draw your attention to, um, on the top picture, uh, you can see back uh, in the in the back corner there, there looks like a little gray box. I wish I had a laser pointer, sorry. Um, that That's a ground flare unit. So instead of a conventional flare stack, I'm sure you folks have seen those around the countryside, uh, the stack with the, the flame at the top. Uh, what we've elected to do um, as to, to minimize our impact to our neighbors, uh, future folks that could be uh, beside us in this uh, um, proposed industrial area is uh, we've gone to a, a, a new piece of equipment called a ground flare unit. So again, uh, you're trying to use some analogies to help uh, folks understand, but it's basically like a big barbecue. Instead of having the, the flare stack up in the air, uh, this one's about 20 feet uh, tall, 25 feet tall. Um, with the edges, and then it just has a series of burners on the inside, so there will be no flame or anything for uh, the neighbors to see there. So, uh, expensive piece of equipment, but we felt that it uh, was very important to move forward with our project and to, uh, again, be a good member of the community. So there, there's just another little uh, a snapshot of what uh, what the facility is going to look like. You can see our existing uh, the 80 acres that we currently own has a home on it already. Uh, we're going to leave the home there. That's going to be uh, a part of our our facility as far as offices, etc. So you can see that on the left hand side of the facility, uh, just on this side of the tree line. So uh, again, fully fenced, fully secured. So I guess if I could uh, move on to the project update portion. Uh, Tidewater's been working with the AER and the surrounding communities for the last several months. Um, roughly uh, since January, I guess, we started the, the process of initiating this project again. We purchased the project and the, uh, the, the idea of the project from, a, from another organization. Um, but Tidewater really kicked it into gear and, and seen its, uh, its need uh, in the last year, I guess. So we uh, kicked the project off back uh, in January, uh, started meeting with uh, AER, members of the community, um, and ultimately, I guess, they're um, folks that live within the city limits now with the new uh, area that's been annexed in. So we've been working with those folks since January. Um, Happy to say that we uh, just received our regulatory approvals, uh, AER provincial regulatory approvals on November 1st, so just last week. So that was uh, a, a good day for us as an organization. We've been working really hard at this, uh, at this uh, project and working with uh, some of the community members uh, on the west end of the city there. So uh, the next step for us uh, to get the facility going is um, submit our development permit for application through the city of Grand Prairie and we expect that submission to be uh, within days here. So we're really looking forward to uh, continuing working with the city and, uh, and, and hopefully getting this, uh, this project off the ground from, from your guys' standpoint as well. Um, one question that's probably uh, burning on people's mind and maybe I can answer it ahead of the, the question period is uh, when are we planning on con starting construction? Um, obviously the development permit process, we have to go through that piece. Um, originally we were hoping to start uh, our construction um, by the end of 2017 yet, um, but we're not sure yet. The AER uh, approval timeline took a little bit longer than what we were expecting, so we have, um, we are evaluating our start time currently right now. We're hoping to get in and do some of the pipeline construction, which again, doesn't affect uh, you folks with the city, but just as a, an awareness piece, we're hoping to get in and do some of the pipeline construction as there are some sensitive areas to the west of the city that we, uh, we'd like to tackle in the winter season, I guess, um, rather than the, the spring or summer. So uh, the facility, um, yeah, we're go through the development permit process and then we'll be evaluating our construction start time from then, from there, so. 
Questions? Thanks very much, gentlemen, for the presentation. Congratulations on achieving your uh, AER uh, approval. Um, any questions for the delegation? Uh, Councillor O'Toole. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the green pipe that's uh, leaving the facility, uh, I know we've heard this before. What's the pressure in there? Like, uh, I know it's not a high pressure, uh, but what kind of pressures are we looking at? Uh, 1,200 1, PSI and maybe off by okay. 20 pounds or so. Yep. Um, same pressure rating as like a, a Nova pipeline. Well, both Nova and Alliance operate around 1,200. So we need to be at that same pressure. And you're kind of assuming that it'll be running uh, natural gas through it majority of the time, except for the odd time when it's market's not there and you're going to store it. Yeah, the the pipeline will always be be full. Yeah. Um, it'll just be it may not be moving gas, but uh, it'll always be full. Okay. So just uh, one more question. I, I really appreciate your report uh, or update. Uh, was there any consideration of uh, with the flare stack or the flare uh, to just maybe regenerate and make power and put it? Is that something that ever come on the table? Not that uh, it matters. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, no. So the the flare stack uh, will not have a constant flare going there. It's it's put in place for depressuring the facility for maintenance work or for. Um, uh, emergency situations. So, no, there's not a, a constant flow of gas to that facility. Thank you. Or to the flare stack, sorry, or flare. Thanks, Councillor Tool. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, thanks, guys, for the report. It's uh, exciting to see something like that maybe coming in the city limits at some point here. So, I, I guess a couple of questions I had is um, how long would we be looking at storing the gas in the facility? Like, is there is there a length of time where you? Can't be stored no longer, or um, yeah. So so gas storage is uh, so so. I'll start with the reservoir a little bit. It produced 100 BCF. So so really, we're licensed to store 100 BCF back into the reservoir. Okay. Um, 35 of that would so be what we deem to be cushion. So that's always going to stay in the reservoir, and we need that cushion in there to provide enough pressure to get the gas out at acceptable rates uh, to meet industry demand. So really, we'll be working with 65 BCF, and that 65 BCF will have the ability to be cycled uh, annually. So 65 in the ground in a year and 65 out within that same year. So, so, so really, you're, you're, you're looking to meet the summer-winter demand, uh, summer being oversupplied and winter typically being undersupplied. So, so we work to to help make up that imbalance. Okay, thank you. And then, um, I guess you guys are hoping to start construction here. You know, maybe maybe early eighteen, late seventeen. When were you hoping to be operational with this facility? With with the whole facility, really, we're hoping for uh, Q1 2019, uh, Q2 2019, April 2019. So the storage year would tend to start April. Uh, where you begin injecting and then uh, be available for withdrawal in November. Thanks, guys. Councillor Minhas. Thank you very much, Scott, for oh, you guys that <coughs> information and updating the project. Uh, my question is to when this construction starts, how many people will be working and when this project run, how many people will be employed afterwards to running? So the, the construction phase will obviously ramp up as there will be quite a number of folks. Uh, the pipeline, I think, will probably have roughly uh, 50 to 60 folks on the pipeline side. And I'm guessing probably the same to construct the facility itself. Uh, Full-time staff there, um, our initial plans are, um, I, I believe, around that four to six um, permanent staff just working at that facility. But that doesn't take into account some of the support staff that uh, will also be uh, probably needed in the Grand Prairie areas, as far as supervisory staff, uh, administrative staff, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Minhas. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue. Gentlemen, I did have one question. I don't know whether it's possible for you to know this at this time or not, but do you foresee with your development permit, um, looking forward, do you foresee any need to request any variances? Um, or does it look like it's, have you had a chance to have that kind of analysis yet? Not that I'm aware of. 
but um, I guess uh, we've we have an engineering team working on our development permit with us. So uh, not nothing that I'm aware of, Mr. Given. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Thanks for coming in and for your presentation, gentlemen. Uh, just a couple questions, things that weren't touched on. Uh, one's clarity for myself. When we're talking about uh, the gas storage, is this above ground or below ground? Uh, below ground. The reservoir is about 1,300 meters below ground. Perfect. And are there any risks associated with that? Um, and the reason why I ask is over the last two years, I've, I've had uh, lots of phone calls from residents in the area and also residents directly in the city. Um, who have s expressed concerns about uh, the safety of putting a plant uh, so close to the city. And I just wanted to know if you guys could uh, ease, ease those concerns uh, live and in person. Yeah, I, I guess uh, like any project like this, um, there are uh, certain risks associated with it. Um, we deem uh, the risk to be quite low. We put a lot of mitigation strategies inside of our facility to mitigate those um, mitigate those concerns, and 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 that risk itself. Uh, one thing that uh, we're proposing uh, over and above what's uh, expected from regulation is uh, installing uh, subsurface safety valves in the wells. So that's a downhole safety valve. So if there's ever an issue with the surface equipment. Uh, there's a downhole emergency shutdown valve that will shut for those wells, which again is over and above uh, expectation. Um, we have a number of um, systems inside the facility as far as uh, flame detection, um, gas leaks, et cetera. So we have a number of components put in place in our plans that mitigate any of those risks and really drop it down to uh, uh, an exitable amount and uh, an amount that we're comfortable with. All right, and uh, just, oh, looks like you had. I, I was just gonna sort of add the, you know, I I believe the AER is, is one of the top regulators probably worldwide. Um, you know, there's there's very uh, uh, regular, rigorous sort of things we need to do when we drill wells and, and uh, testing of the wells prior to putting them into service for uh, a storage application um, and, and we're, you know, we work hard to be in compliance with all of that and, and ensure that we are. Awesome, and uh, just one final question. Uh, once operational and constructed, how long would you be able to operate the plant? Are we talking 40 to 50 years, 100 years, 20 years? Um, yeah, I, I would say 50 to 100 years, likely. Uh, it, it should be a long-term uh, uh, facility, provided there's a, a demand for natural gas. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thanks, Councilor Thiessen. Uh, I don't see anybody else in the queue. Uh, gentlemen, thanks very much for uh, being here tonight to update uh, the new council at the very start of its term on your project. Uh, looking forward to, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you and Tidewater over the coming uh, years and months. Uh, but thanks very much for being here very, at the very start. Great, and I actually do have a few pamphlets that I'll uh, pass around as well. Thank you. Uh, again, you could maybe just leave them with uh, Mr. Olinger um, right here to your right, uh, and he can circulate them to council. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Okay, I think that's handled all of our delegation business. As I look out through the crowd that's still assembled in the council chambers, it doesn't look like there's anybody else that's going to be coming forward, but this opportunity does exist. We do always appreciate if people let us know ahead of time that they'll be coming. Uh, so we'll move on through our agenda. We have no items uh, under public hearings. We have no items of unfinished business. And so that takes us to item 8.1, development authority appointments. Um, and uh, I think we have a recommendation from administration to make some appointments of uh, development officers. Mr. Wright, are you going to introduce this for us? Uh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> good evening, Mayor Given and members of City Council. My name's Stuart Wright, the Development Permitting Supervisor. This is a request for appointment of development officers. Um, in August of this year, Rhonda Lafay retired after serving with the City for 25 years. Ms. Lafay um, spent most of that time as the lead senior commercial and industrial development officer. So um, we did look to recruit thereafter and we have hired Mr. Eugene Tobin. Um, Mr. Tobin does come with extensive um, experience in municipal government and other fields. Um, he has 16 years experience in advancing roles in municipal government. Um, he worked for the city of Cornerbrook in Newfoundland. Um, in the role of development officer and senior development officer. 
Thereafter, um, he moved to Strathcona County, where he worked as a senior development officer. Um, most recently, uh, Mr. Tobin was working in Saddle Hills County, where he was um, working in planning, development and engineering roles. Mr. Tobin's additional experience um, is in building safety codes, GIS, engineering infrastructure and enforcement of uh, land use bylaws. He also has professional designations in planning and development and is a certified engineering technologist. The second part of this request is um, somewhat less interesting because it's about me. <laughs> um, in the role of um, development permitting supervisor, um, it's not um, typically in that position where um, you would sign off um, and issue development permits. However, looking at this and um, the expectations certainly with the economy going to be picking up and um, um, just to provide that um, potentially for more complex um, projects, um, administration is seeking um, council support to actually um, authorise me to be um, development officer as well to be able to sign issue permits. So section 624 of the Municipal Government Act states that council must provide for a development authority. Section 11.3 of the city's land use bylaw states that the development authority shall be the development officer committee or where the context of the bylaw permits city council. And section 12.2 of the land use bylaw states that the person or persons to fill the office of development officer shall be appointed by resolution of council. Therefore, administration recommends that uh, Ms. Eugene Tobin and myself, Stuart Ray, be appointed by resolution of council to the role of development officer for the purpose of administering the land use bylaw. And if council has any questions, I'll be glad. Thanks very much, Mr. Wright. Uh, so, Council, uh, we have that introduction from administration. Um, I don't know if there are any questions at this time, but if not, I'd look for a motion uh, as recommended in our package. Councillor O'Toole. I move that Council appoint Mr. Eugene Tolvern and Mr. Stuart Wright as development officers in accordance with the requirements of the Municipal Government Act and Land Use Bylaw C-1260. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you, and that motion carries. Uh, so we'll move on to item 8.2, and I'll look to our city manager for a brief introduction of this item. I heard the operative word, uh, Mr. Mayor, is being brief, so uh, I will make it so. Um, I have a, a similar announcement to make or a similar recommendation to make to the uh, council tonight. Uh, this one involves our uh, Susan Walker. This council, I'm sure, is aware uh, earlier this year, uh, Ken and Anderson retired as our Chief Financial Officer and Director of Corporate Services, uh, and a recruitment commenced uh, to find a replacement for Ken. Uh, that recruitment was national and done using a, uh, a headhunter out of Calgary to make sure that we had the very best candidate uh, for our organization here in Grand Prairie. Uh, at the conclusion of that uh, search and that selection process, Susan Walker was selected to be our Corporate Services Director and Chief Financial Officer. I think you've all met Susan. She has had a long and, uh, and very distinguished career uh, in the City of Grand Prairie. In fact, nobody knows the organization better than Susan. Uh, the leadership team has welcomed her as part of the leadership team. Part of the process, though, according to... Um, uh, bylaw C-1277, Section 3.2, uh, that being the City Administration Bylaw, is that Susan should be uh, appointed Corporate Services Director as a designated officer. Uh, and there are certain roles and responsibilities that come with that designation. So with respect, uh, Mr. Mayor, I would ask that that recommendation be honoured. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. City Manager. Uh, any questions or motions arising? Councillor Thiessen. Just a motion if there are no questions. Please. I'd like to do this as soon as possible. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I would move that Council appoint Ms. Susan Walker as the Corporate Services Director as a designated officer, effective October 1st, 2017, pursuant to Section 3.2 of Bylaw C-1277, being the City Administration Bylaw. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Again, seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. 
Thank you. There we go, and congratulations, Miss Walker. Welcome to the team, or welcome back to the team. <laughs> uh, then that'll take us to item 8.3. Um, there was a uh, administrative oversight or an oversight, excuse me, at our uh, council organizational meeting. There is one organization that we are required to make an appointment to um, as a part of the uh, structure of the organization. That's the South Peace Regional Archives Society. And so this wasn't in the list of mayor's recommendations uh, at our organizational meeting. Um, I am recommending to uh, council that uh, you would approve uh, Councillor Pilat as uh, council's representative to that organization. Um, and this would uh, form one of our regular reports at uh, regular council meetings. Uh, and so I would uh, look for a motion to uh, uh, pass that recommendation. Councillor Bressy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. I would move that we approve the mayor's recommendation to appoint Councillor Palat to the South Peace Regional Archi Archive Society. Thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. Any discussion or debate on that recommendation? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Uh, and that'll take us to 8.4, uh, Subdivision and Development Appeal Board, temporary member, uh, temporary public member appointments. Um, and I don't know if we have a member of administration that wants to introduce this, but uh, council does have a need to appoint a minimum of two public members, the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board uh, for temporary terms, uh, for the exclusive purpose of uh, one specific meeting uh, coming up December 4th. Uh, Ms. Williams, how did I do on that? Was there anything else that we need to cover? That's pretty much it, uh, Mayor Given. We do have the need for three um, board members to be appointed for a special um, development appeal board hearing that will be happening in December. So we do recommend that there are three members being appointed to this. Okay, thank you very much. And so I would uh, look for a motion, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, just uh, for a bit of context, uh, there was uh, five applicants that uh, put their name forward, and we have uh, chosen three, even though we only have to select the two minimum. Uh, and to that extent, I would move that Council appoint Lynn Coulter, Cheryl Schindel, and Alan Tibbles as alternate members to the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board for the purpose of attending the SDAB hearing scheduled for December 4th, 2017, in compliance with the consent order of the Court of Appeal of Alberta. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Okay. Again, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, and that handles all of our items of reports and would take us to committee business. And as I was looking at this, I thought, well, aren't we lucky that the two council members that were chairing the two committees that we have coming to this agenda actually are still on council? That worked out pretty well. Uh, the first is Councillor Clayton with uh, item 9.1, Community Growth Committee meeting. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, so kind of fittingly, it'll be the last time that I make this motion, actually, with the restructure of uh, committees. So I would uh, move that council receive the minutes of the Community Growth Committee meeting held Tuesday, September 19th, as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Are there any errors or omissions that we need to correct before we adopt them? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Uh, and we'll move to 9.2, the Pursuit of Excellence Committee meeting. Councillor O'Toole. Sorry, Councillor O'Toole, just get your microphone there. Better. Sorry. I move the council receive the minutes of the Pursuit of Excellence Committee meeting held Thursday, October 5th, 2017, as presented. And to speak of that, uh, we had a bunch of money. We gave a bunch out. And uh, with that, we gave some money towards uh, athlete travel funding, coach travel, clinic hosting. We gave away an award to uh, Morel Martins as the Perky Malkala Award and uh, split uh, with the Bob Newfeld Award Tamara D and Zachary Malstrom. Okay. And, uh, we plan to run the pot dry. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Well, that's certainly what that fund is for to support uh, our athletes as they progress in their careers. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Okay. Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. That handles all of our committee business for this evening, I believe. 
um, and takes us uh, to the uh, last few items. Uh, we have no items of correspondence, uh, but item 11 is delegation business. Uh, we did have our three delegations, uh, the residents of the Shores, condominiums, um, uh, uh, Mr. Gorman and his team from Evergreen Park, and uh, Mr. McLean, uh, from Tidewater, and so I would look for a motion dealing with each of those. My recommendation to Council would be that um, uh, that they be uh, generally, uh, uh, the first two certainly would be probably most appropriate to refer them to the appropriate standing committee. I think the last one was something that we'll be hearing more about as it comes, uh, was probably more just for information. So, uh, But we'll deal with them one at a time, so Councillor Clayton. Governor Gibbon, I would move that uh, Council um, approve the recommendation to um, uh, send the the first delegation from the Shores um, gated community to the appropriate standing committee. Sure. sure, just to refer that issue for review to the appropriate standing yeah. committee. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any discussion or debate on that motion? Um, I guess just for council's information, as they acknowledged at the start, uh, there was a present uh, a report written by administration, so administration would have an opportunity to bring that report back uh, to the standing committee. Council could review that and see if there was any additional information or, or different direction that would need to be taken at that point. So just in terms of process. Uh, any other discussion or debate? Okay, again, seeing nobody ringing in, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. So our uh, next delegation was the uh, presentation from Evergreen Park. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, I may do two uh, motions for this one, uh, but the first one being that I would uh, move that uh, the uh, that sorry, council refer the option of uh, transit to Evergreen Park to the appropriate standing committee. Okay. Okay. You want to deal with the two uh, sort, sort of, of separately? Yeah. Independently. Okay. Sure. Uh, there were uh, distinct things. Um, any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries, and Councillor Clayton. So I have a question in regards to process. Um, these appropriate standing committees, if there's any budget implications, meet between now and the budget discussion. Uh, what are the opportunities for some of these discussions to get to the budget discussion starting November 15th? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think probably fair to say that that would be pretty challenging. Uh, that may be why Councillor Thiessen is making a distinction with the second motion. Um, Councillor Thiessen? Thank you very much, Mayor Given, and thank you, Councillor Clayton. That's uh, exactly what I was getting at. I didn't think that we had enough time to address the funding request to Evergreen, and uh, that's totally in the purview of Council to do that. So in saying that, I would move that uh, we refer uh, the request for $200,000 for next year uh, to budget deliberations. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, that motion is open for discussion and debate. Uh, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, and then we had our final presentation uh, from Tidewater. And again, I, I think that's most likely just one to be received for information. Um, I think that's the context it was provided in. Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I move that we uh, accept the uh, report given by Tidewater as uh, information. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Again, seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. It's Tidewater Midstream Infrastructure Limited. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor O'Toole. And that motion carries. Uh, I think that deals with all of our delegation business. Uh, we have no notice of motion this evening, and I think we have only a couple of uh, council member reports. And uh, this section is an opportunity for council members to report on any external bodies or committees that they may represent the city of Grand Prairie on. And I think we'll start with Councillor Thies. And I think you said that you had uh, Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance. I uh, yes, I sure did. We don't, I don't have actually much to report. I was just happy that we had an opportunity to have this meeting. Um, largely, uh, it was just a, your standard meeting. A couple updates from administration on uh, the workings uh, within the office uh, uh, and outside of the office as far as uh, promoting our integrated watershed management plan. Uh, we also had guest speaker Andrew Shop, uh, the acting service delivery coordinator uh, for community engagement for AEP. 
uh, talking about uh, WPAC's roles in the review and of community-based monitoring updates. And we had a, a thorough discussion in and around that. We also received uh, further uh, updates on our integrated watershed management plan, which uh, I did uh, for our new councillors uh, put this uh, out on your desk in the back and I think a one in the mailbox. I strongly encourage you to review it if you can. Uh, it addresses the Peace River and, and all of its tributaries that uh, flow in and around Grand Prairie in the Peace Region. Uh, we're looking for feedback by November 15th, so uh, hopefully read it before we get into budget deliberations because by November 15th we'll be right in the middle of it. Uh, so uh, if you have an opinion, uh, now's the time to do it because uh, if there is no negative feedback, we will take this draft and put it right into action. Uh, finally, we did touch on uh, strategic plan review uh, and we made some notes that uh, it needs to be updated from when it was originally created in 2010, uh, especially since one of our two main goals was creating a state of the watershed report, which is done, and the other being creating an integrated watershed management plan, which is in the final phases of its draft presentation. So that should be done and ready for implementation soon. And that is all I have for Mighty Peace. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Um, and then next up was uh, Councillor Blackburn, and I think you had a Grand Spirit meeting. Thank you, uh, Mayor Gibbon. I attended the uh, Grand Spirit Foundation uh, board meeting uh, this last week, and um, primarily we were talking about the work done on um, on Lakeview, which is the new facility in Claremont. Um, for the most part, it was uh, follow up on uh, deficiencies and so on, and there uh, there's also some capital work yet to be done. Uh, they're looking at building a storage garage and uh, and a couple of other facilities that will help uh, with the operation. It was a good meeting. Uh, people on that board are very passionate uh, about uh, about the residents uh, throughout their region. And uh, the only other thing I'll mention is that next month, December 1st, is their AGM. And then we'll have a look at what's up for the next year. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn and Councillor Clayton. Given, although I haven't been to a meeting, I just wanted to let everybody know that tonight at midnight is the deadline if you're looking to buy Nighthawk season passes. The uh, the rate goes up tomorrow, so if you're looking for a season pass, and they've also introduced, I saw on their website, uh, options for monthly payment this year. So for those who want to buy a family pass for the hill, they'll take a uh, installment over four months. So it goes up after midnight tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Clayton and Councillor Plot. Uh, although I missed the meeting for the oops, <laughs> you're on. Oh, you're good. Although I missed the meeting for the downtown association, um, I did get some notes from it. Um, so I just want to bring to attention just a few of the the, the keynotes that were that the last downtown association meeting had. Uh, decreased planning width of the sidewalks, uh, decreased size of the corner ball boats, um, include art inspired crosswalks. Um, improved communication, which is also, I mean, I guess when I was out campaigning, that was definitely something that was brought up a lot. Uh, the assistance with uh, signing um, and how do we get to businesses during construction. Um, uh, include a, some kind of a construction cost uh, for the installation of backflow preventers or equivalent where necessary. And also the city looking at um, having a project manager on this. So just want to bring that to everybody's attention. Thanks, Councillor Platt. Uh, I think if that's all of our external agencies, boards, and commissions, uh, then we'll start with Council Member Roundtable, uh, where Council Members can report on some of the activities that they've attended uh, to represent the City of Grand Prairie. And we'll start with Councillor Bressy. You, You'll just have to start your microphone, though. Oh. Like that? Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you, Mayor Given. I want to acknowledge this is a privilege. This is a lot of fun, guys, to do this with you. So thank you for being here. Uh, an event I went to is I spent a lot of time at skate parks. I don't skateboard, but I spent a lot of time getting to know teenagers in skate parks as my part of my other job. And so I went to the skateboard skate park master planning session. And something I want to bring to your awareness is that this has been brought forward by a number of older skateboarders who are more my age, who are really determined to have something for the younger kids in our community. They want to teach them how to skate. They want to teach them some life skills. They want to have something positive or younger kids in this community. That's what this is about, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about the skateboarding master plan, and I hope that we can support it. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Councillor O'Toole. 
Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I did a number of events in the last two weeks, but one I'd like to uh, bring to attention is I had uh, the opportunity to take my oldest granddaughter to work for the day. And that was organized through the city manager's office and his assistant. And we ended up going through uh, all the city hall, everything from uh, taxation, which my granddaughter wasn't all that keen on. She didn't know much, thought that part was boring. But uh, we all through went through uh, the GIS department and uh, how the, the maps were done and how the underwater uh, underground services were. And uh, that she thought was kind of neat. We went through uh, the city services building and we got to see some of the uh, the jobs the different areas of the city op uh, used to operate the city. And then the final part was we got to go underneath the 25 meter pool at the East Link Centre and see the workings and how the how the system is cleaned and monitored and maintained and got to see uh, uh, have good conversation with all the staff at all the different areas. So it was a real eye-opening experience for my granddaughter and I want to thank all the staff, city manager, and uh, making that a great day for my granddaughter. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Tool. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. I'll just bring up a couple of events that I don't think any other council member, members were at. I attended the, I brought greetings on behalf of the mayor and council at the Ronald McDonald House uh, Superhero Soiree. Uh, it was a great event. I had never personally been to the event and uh, lots of family fun. I took my kids and they raised lots of money and there was um, fun for kids and a kid's dance, uh, but also uh, great stories from the successes of that facility. So I was uh, very happy to be at that event. As well, um, I attended the, the Nighthawk Alpine Ski Team annual fundraiser this past weekend. They moved it to the Golden Age Centre, which was a, a great facility for that event. And uh, one other event uh, I attended, I think uh, Councillor Friesen was there and Councillor Minhas, the Grand Prairie Regional College President's Ball. If anyone else is there, I apologize. Um, it was an annual event and, and from all um, from all word I hear so far, the uh, the numbers were great this year and they raised a lot of money. So that was it for this time. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clayton. Councillor Minhas. Yes, I was with the Jackie and the President Ball. We had good fun there and also I was quite busy with our community thing in our church and we did some things. So I didn't go in many places because we just start up. So that's what we did. Thanks very much, Councillor Minhas. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I attended three days of council orientation. Where was everybody else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Everyone was there. That was fantastic. I just want to thank uh, administration for putting that together. I thought that was really valuable. In addition to that, I went to the art gallery preview for this upcoming year. And what I'm most excited about there, there will be a student um, curated show upcoming and wh where was the student from you were there was it is it a gprc student or gprc yeah so that's uh that's something to look forward to um i attended the legion open house on the 25th of october and pards dine and dance this weekend as well as the president's ball uh thank you thanks very much councillor friesen councillor plot thanks mayor given um i guess i had a few events the first one was uh the breakfast with the guys uh at, the, at howlers which was which was a great event and it sounds like it was one of their better received events in, in previous years so that was that was good uh legion wine and cheese was interesting as well um that was a, a interesting event um probably my, my highlights for the last couple of weeks though were the county recreational plan out at entrex center they had a really good turnout i would say well over 100 people over there um, and a lot of very passionate people, of course, when you're talking about recreation, there's lots of passionate people, but I think there's a really cool opportunity for the city to maybe looking at getting involved with that at some point. Um, I think it's going to have a lot of, uh, potential for, you know, off leak dog parks, uh, you know, as the, as the plan builds in, I think it's going to be a really good regional facility. And then on the weekend, uh, I attended the parts, um, fundraiser, which I don't, I hadn't been to that fundraiser in the past. Some, some very amazing speeches well, re well received. Uh, I don't know what their targeting goals for for uh, for funds uh, earned, but it sure seemed like the the auction pieces were going well and uh, people were having fun. So I, I think it was a good event, and, and hopefully they achieve their goals. Thanks, Councillor Plot. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Given. Um, 
Two events that I attended over the past little while are the uh, Art Gallery Season Preview and Breakfast with the Guys, and they've both been spoken to uh, eloquently already. I won't repeat um, the points. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Thiessen. Well, it looks like we're all attending the same meetings. Um, Councillor O'Toole's giving me the gun sign because I do a lot of events over the last little bit. He told me I can only speak to one, so I'm only going to speak to one because I don't want to turn into old yeller. Uh, with Councillor O'Toole here in the back. Uh, so the event I'm going to speak to is uh, Festivale uh, as part of the Scarecrow Festival's uh, offerings to the community. Uh, I had the opportunity the privilege to not only be the MC for the event, but also to be able to give greetings on behalf of the city since I was uh, the only member there uh, on City Council. Uh, and uh, as was the case with the Odyssey House's fundraiser and the President's Ball, Festivale was an incredible success. I think there was over 500 people in attendance, uh, and uh, the beer was flowing. The times were good, and the prizes were handed out. And uh, I had a great time. And uh, the members of the Sunrise Rotary Club were overjoyed with the with the turnout and the response from the community, especially on a night where all these other great events were happening. It's good to see that coming back in our community. Uh, finally, I just want to make mention: uh, it is uh, Movember. Uh, November, normally I don't grow a mustache, and I know I got this gross thing on my face right now. Uh, so part of that's for prostate cancer, same with the Terry Fox t-shirt. But I'm a man of multiple meanings here, so I'm also wearing purple, uh, just to make everyone aware of the fact that it is, uh, it is uh, uh, Family Violence Prevention Awareness Month as well in the, in the month of November. So to that extent, I, I decided not to grow a mustache, I decided to grow a, a wolf stash. Uh, because most of the victims of uh, domestic violence happen to be women and children, and uh, they tend to get trapped in those situations. So instead of just wearing purple or doing something pretty, I'm doing something real ugly and putting it on my face with my woe stash. So when I, you see me do this, I'm making a, a reference to the ladies uh, who otherwise uh, you know, uh, are not doing as well as, as they could be in these types of situations, uh, and also supporting the people suffering from cancer. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen, I think. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. Oh. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, you know what, then we'll just briefly turn our attention to the calendar. Uh, in addition to some of the meetings that were already highlighted by other members of council that were in attendance, uh, there were a couple that I was uh, the only one attending at. Uh, I w had the pride of uh, representing the city to bring greetings to uh, the retirement party for Kelly Sutherland. Uh, many members, I'm sure all members of our community, recognize Kelly Sutherland as a world-class chuck wagon uh, racer. Um, but more than that, I think Kelly has uh, really uh, put Grand Prairie on the provincial scene uh, for longer than I have been alive. Uh, and so at the uh, at the uh, event, I had uh, had sort of an epiphany that there's a close tie between uh, Kelly and our own uh, former councillor Helen Rice. Uh, both uh, representing Grand Prairie on the provincial scene in their own unique way, um, but really uh, demonstrating that Grand Prairie can compete with anybody out there. Uh, and Kelly has certainly done that. Uh, it was a pleasure to represent the city of Grand Prairie, uh, considering how well he's represented our community uh, over the years. Um, on Monday the 30th, I had the opportunity to go to a mayor's conference. Uh, this was the grade four class at Ivy Macklin. This is the third year in a row where they've had a mayor's conference. They invite mayors from all across the province to come, and they each present a fact about their community. Um, all of the mayors are from that grade four class, so it's actually a very short travel distance. Um, but it's a pleasure to be the mayor of Grand Prairie and uh, welcome all these other mayors from across the province as the students do some practical learning um, as they sort of represent these communities and speak as though they were the mayor of those communities. So it's a pleasure to be invited there. Um, and then on Wednesday the 1st, I had the opportunity to uh, be at East Link Centre uh, where the Family Violence uh, Prevention Coalition um, uh, hosted a proclamation reading and a kickoff of Family Violence Prevention Month. Uh, it was my pleasure to make that proclamation on behalf of the city and do that jointly with the Reeve of the County, uh, Reeve Land Beaupre. And with that, I think we'll call our meeting adjourned. Thank you.